I'm Laurie Actman with the Penn Center for Innovation. Um, we're Penn's commercialization organization, and we work directly with faculty and external partners to translate ideas into the marketplace. Um, one of uh, the schools, obviously, we work with is Penn Engineering, where there's some amazing um, both um, technological innovation across many disciplines occurring, and a lot of interest from outside partners in um, kind of what we're discovering here. Um, so it's an exciting time. And um, one of the key partners we work with are outside law firms to um, help us with our intellectual property and patenting issues and process. And um, today I'm really pleased um, that we can host one of our key external partners and Aaron Rabinowitz with Baker Hostetler. Um, he's a partner there and a patent attorney, among other things. He brings an amazing background, including, I noticed, um, a master's degree from Penn and um, works with our faculty um, on their IP and patenting issues. Um, there's actually some great information on the website um, at his law firm on his page. Sure. And also, I just wanted to note, um, today we're also joined by PCI's head of IP, Jennifer Langenberger. Jen, thanks for being here, who's also a fantastic resource around these issues. So um, without further ado, Aaron, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate the, the kind intro, and I really appreciate the invitation to, uh, to speak to the group today. Um, I also really appreciate, Laurie, that you did not give my graduation year from Penn, so I really appreciate that. It was a long time ago, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, as, as Laurie said, I'm uh, outside counsel for University of Pennsylvania. I was a, a chemical engineer by, by training, uh, and I've been uh, fortunate enough to work with, with Penn uh, for a number of years, uh, especially with with Jennifer, who's joining us uh, on the on the Zoom call, uh, and I've had the the good fortune to work with uh, inventors uh, in in a couple different schools uh, at Penn, and in particular the engineering school where I, I uh, had, had done my own work some years ago. So um, very happy to be here. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, with faculty and, and grad students and postdocs. Um, so uh, I was really pleased and, and very flattered that. Laurie reached out to have me give a, a discussion today. Um, and as Laurie said, we'll talk about uh, sort of the role that engineers and inventors play in patenting in general. Uh, we're gonna talk about some of the things that, uh, that Penn in particular has been up to recently. Um, and then I thought we'd sort of finish off with some, some interesting trends, or at least interesting to me, um, some interesting trends in just kind of patents in general uh, in the last couple of years. So, yeah, again, thanks again for inviting me. So today we'll be talking about uh, IP and patenting uh, for engineers, but uh, I think these are things that everyone can apply to, uh, you know, whether you're engineers or, or otherwise. So uh, just briefly, uh, the introduction we've kind of covered uh, we'll talk just briefly about sort of flavors of IP, uh, and then we'll sort of do a deeper dive into patents, uh, in particular Penn's activity uh, in this most recent year. A um, couple stories about why keeping good records uh, as researchers and inventors, why that matters. These are true stories. Um, and then again, we'll talk about some, some recent, recent patenting trends, and then we'll, we'll go to some uh, conclusion and, and some questions. Um, so first of all, I, I made this uh, a couple of days ago over lunchtime, so I was pretty hungry. So I think everyone knows there's, there's kind of four flavors of IP, um, copyrights, uh, patents, trademarks, and trade secrets. And I, I'm, I'm gonna focus today on, uh, on patents, of course. Um, and just briefly, copyrights have to do with, uh, you know, sort of ideas or things that are expressed and sort of are fixed in you know, what they call a tangible medium. So something that's written down or recorded. Uh, trademarks are things that, that are used to uh, convey the source of a good, say, uh, say a brand, like a logo, like the Nike logo, um, the Apple logo, things like that, so that when you see something, you know where it came from. Uh, and trade secrets are, uh, just as they sound like, they are uh, secrets of, of commercial value um, that uh, are very valuable to their users. So the example people always give is the formula for Coke um, or the technology or the technique really for making, uh, for example, Thomas's English muffins. So I don't know if anybody's ever had uh, a non Thomas's English muffin, but they're not very good. Uh, and that's because Thomas's has an excellent process for making English muffins and that's kind of their, their trade secret. So anyway, we're gonna talk today though, mostly about patents um, and patents are uh, really um, sort of a right. Uh, 
uh, to sort of exclude others from, from making, using, or, or selling your technology. It's kind of like a deed um, to your, uh, sort of your piece of, of property. And patents take many, many forms. Uh, they can really protect uh, just about any form of technology. There's a few, exa few examples here, um, compositions of matter, medical devices, uh, coding, uh, coatings, uh, medical imaging, uh, and, and sort of techniques associated with all of these things, even methods of making things, methods of putting, of assembling something, things like that. Um, certainly we see things in the news about vaccines, uh, that those are things ca that can also be patented. And, and a patent is really kind of a business tool or, or business asset. It's something that can be licensed to others. Uh, it's something you can use to kind of practice and uh, defend your, your own technology. There's a lot of things you can do uh, with, with patents. So I didn't spend too much time on, on that, but just, you know, as, as kind of a broad view, uh, you can see there's a lot of things you can do with them. And certainly we can see why they're, they're very valuable. Um, so what about engineers, right? Where do, where do engineers fit in? And, and the truth is that, that engineers can, can really fit in at, at just about every step of the, the process. And I think with um, kind of particular focus on, on PEN and, and, and PCI or PEN, PEN Center for Innovation, um, you know, we know what engineers do, right? Develop technology. Um, that's on the front end. Uh, another piece that's sort of in the middle is uh, advising PCI on, on progress. Um, you know, it's, you know, technologies that the engineers are working on are, are valuable uh, for all kinds of reasons and, and uh, PCI can help uh, uh, with sort of technology development, uh, technology strategy, and, and as, as Laurie said earlier, um, commercializing that, that technology that um, everyone's work, you know, worked so hard on. Um, and, you know, really at, at Penn um, and with PCI, engineers can help in a very important way. They can assist PCI and, and legal counsel uh, with patent strategy. Um, some of these technologies are, are important, but also fairly intricate. And that's where the inventors can really help uh, by helping to explain things to, uh, to the patent examiners when that's needed. Sometimes a patent examiner, uh, they're smart, uh, but they're also very busy and sometimes overworked. And sometimes they just don't quite have the time to, to really appreciate some of the subtleties of a given technology. So um, that's a really important role uh, that pen engineers and, and other inventors can play in really helping kind of move the ball forward at, at the patent office. Uh, and also, you know, of course, supporting commercialization of technology. Um, and again, working closely with, uh, with Jennifer and, and everyone over at, uh, at PCI. Um, so just kind of keeping the focus on Penn, um, recently there was a, a really nice report that, that PCI circulated. I think some of you have probably seen it. If not, it's available, I think, on, online. Um, but I just wanted to kind of uh, sort of pull out a couple highlights just to give everyone a sense of just, just how active and um, just, you know, what a productive uh, year it's been for, for Penn and PCI, even in, in a particularly challenging year um, like this past one. So um, here's sort of a, a chart of just, you know, some highlights that, uh, that PCI has, has accomplished in the past year. And I just want to draw attention to a couple of things. Uh, so I'm going to zoom in there. Um, just in this last year, again, a challenging year. Um, you know, not, not everyone had sort of total uh, typical access to their labs and so on. Um, but despite all that, um, Penn can, can log 705 uh, patent applications filed in, in fiscal year 2020, uh, which is great. Um, 84 US patents issued in, in the year. Um, that's about seven patents, uh, granted patents per month, which is great. Um, and also um, a lot of important commercial activity taking place outside of Penn. See here um, with the highlighting, uh, there were 14 uh, PCI facilitated Penn spinouts uh, and well over really half a billion dollars um, raised or received by, by Penn affiliated startups. And again, this is in you know, what I think everyone can agree is, is a pretty challenging year. So really great work um, happening at, at, at Penn and PCI in this past year and all of it um, you know, driven by Great work by uh, by engineers and, and other other inventors. So I just wanted to highlight that just to kind of set the stage of what you know what Penn what's happening at Penn these days. Um, so we talked earlier about keeping uh, PCI sort of advised on on event of progress and and when it comes to patents, um, kind of like other other things in life, uh, timing is really everything. And and uh, in, in, one important thing to know about patents is. Um, it's very difficult or your ability to obtain patent protection is limited when you're trying to obtain protection on something that's already out in the public. Uh, and that means uh, sort of where the rubber hits the road in, in terms of patenting. Uh, if you have a technology, um, of course, there's, there's always a great interest in publishing as quickly as you can. But uh, if, it, if you 
publish an article as, uh, as everyone is, is sort of trained to do, uh, but then file a patent afterwards, that limits the kind of the flavors of patent protection that, um, that are available. So if the article is published, that means that technology in the article is now out in the public, uh, and filing a patent apl application afterwards means you can only obtain patent application typically um, more or less in the United States and your ability to obtain uh, patent protection outside of the US is, is limited and, and sometimes, uh, sometimes it's zero. Whereas uh, on the flip side, uh, working closely with PCI, uh, filing the patent application before the article is published uh, protects the ability of PCI and, and any startups uh, to obtain worldwide patent rights. And you know, everyone knows the U.S. is a bit is a large, important economy, but there's plenty of opportunities outside the U.S. Um, and and that's why it's it's important to again keep PCI involved, uh, keep them advised of your progress, uh, and when possible, file that patent application with PCI's help. Um, before articles are published. And I should say that um, what's key here is, is filing the patent application before the technology becomes public. And that public disclosure of the technology could be in the form of an article, could be in the form of a uh, presentation, um, poster presentation, uh, you know, all sorts of things um, can make an, uh, technology public. And again, can't say it enough, but I'll say it again. Uh, it's important to file that patent application before the technology becomes public. Um, so again, keeping PCI in the loop, um, as we just saw, advise PCI before a technology is publicly disclosed. If you're right, working on a manuscript, uh, working on a presentation, um, important to keep PCI ad advised and they can help uh, kind of sequence the uh, filing of a patent application around your uh, publication date or other dates that you, you have to be mindful of as the, as the authors. Um, and again, public disclosure can take many forms. There's traditional journals, um, you know, that publish in hard copy, but these journals will sometimes publish an article, kind of an advanced copy online, um, and sometimes without very little warning or advance notice. Um, so it's important to be mindful of that. Um, thesis archives, these archives are online uh, and can be searchable. So even a thesis, um, which seems like it's kind of kept within the four corners of Penn, can, can be, or other universities, can be accessed, uh, can be found, um, and that's considered a public disclosure. Um, conference presentations, I think a lot of conferences have, uh, have gone virtual, things that would have been in person before going virtual now. Um, those kinds of presentations can count uh, as a public disclosure and, and can harm your, your patent rights. Uh, and also there's online only art, uh, publications like Archive, uh, Med Archive and, and other similar ones that I think are popular destinations for articles. Um, they're ways to sort of get the word out about a great technology uh, before a formal publication takes place. Um, but again, these online only uh, publications, they count um, as public disclosures and, and can sort of adversely affect your, your patent rights. So again, most important thing, advise PCI uh, before there's a public disclosure of, of your technology. Um, so I promised to tell some stories about record keeping, and I know everyone's favorite thing to do uh, is to keep good notebooks, um, but there are a couple of reasons why this is very, very important, and especially when it comes to the patent world. So I wanted to just touch on, on some of these things as well. Um, again, one thing to consider, and I know this is in everybody's notebooks, when was the technology first developed? Um, when was, you know, kind of the idea of whatever technology, perhaps it's a coding, uh, medical device, whatever it is, when was that technology first developed and sort of conceived? Uh, because as we'll see in a bit, the date of kind of conception is important. Um, also, who's in the cast of characters that worked on the technology? You know, labs are big, um, people are spread out, especially now that we're, we're all working virtually. Um, but again, who's in that cast of characters who worked on the technology? And, and the reason that's important to know is it's important to know who are the true inventors of a technology uh, versus who are those who, who helped, but maybe weren't really part of the, the conception. And the reason this is important is in a patent application, we have to list as inventors only those who really conceived of and contributed to the technology, not just those people who uh, were a great help in lab, but were really just kind of following directions. Um, where are these characters located? Are they all located at Penn? Um, are they at other institutions where, uh, you know, you, you have collaborators. Um, are they at corporations uh, where you may have collaborators or some sort of, uh, you know, sponsored research agreement, um, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, maybe your collaborators are located at a, a federal research lab like um, Los Alamos or Sandia, those sorts of things. Um, these things are all important because it's important to know uh, where the inventors are from, 
uh, because where the inventors are from could have some influence over who owns the, the sort of the ultimate patent application. Um, again, these are things easily kept track of, um, but important to do it. Uh, and again, as we talked about earlier, who can see the technology? Who are the true inventors? And who sort of just followed directions? Um, you know, patent applications, excuse me, are not like articles where in an article, you know, everyone who, work, everyone who works on a technology can be listed as, a, as an author on a journal article. Um, that's not always the case for a patent application because again, the inventors are really just those people who conceive the technology. Um, also, what sort of funding was used? Uh, is there NSF funding, NIH funding, um, uh, you know, DARPA grants, those sorts of things, um, even non-federal funding. Um, it's important to know, you know where that support came from because again, that, that could affect ownership of the patent application uh, at one level, on another level, um, there are certain reporting obligations that uh, institutions have to report to the agencies that fund their research. Um, so it's important to keep track of uh, what funding was, was used, who had that funding, uh, and, and those sorts of details. Um, and a third, or I guess really sort of a final thing to consider in the record keeping is, was there any use of material? Um, you know, a sample, uh, you know, starting material, cells, uh, you know, a coding, polymer, something like that. Is there any use of something that was subject to a third party obligation? Um, again, important to keep track of this uh, just because it can have some, uh, some uh, important implications for ownership uh, and, and that, sort of, that sort of thing. Um, and so uh, I thought I would sort of encapsulate this in, in a quick chart. Um, you have sort of the universe of people uh, who worked on the technology, which is very important to know for patent purposes, but also, who actually conceived the technology. So you have people who worked on it, but not everyone who worked on it really conceived the technology. Uh, and then you have this other universe of people who had federal funding. Um, so it's important to sort of keep track of all of these things um, for purposes of having uh, correct inventorship on a patent application and also for the institution to, to meet any sort of reporting requirements it might have when it comes to funding uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so again, keeping with the, the exciting but very important theme of, of record keeping, um, I have a couple, uh, I guess what I would call war stories here of where good record keeping sort of saved the day uh, when it came to, to some very important patents. So one example was a patent application uh, that was filed in, in May, 2004. And four years later, uh, the US Patent Office gets around to looking at this patent application and rejects it and says that everything in this application that was filed in 2004 had already been described or discussed in an article written by Smith uh, from January 7th, 2004. And this looks like bad news because you can't get, a patent up, can't get a patent on something that someone else previously described. But this particular inventor, uh, who is a pen inventor, I, I will not name their names, but very appreciative of their, their record keeping, um, you know, you can see that this article predates the, the patent application, but the pen inventor um, kept excellent records and had a grant application that they filed December 29th, 2003, uh, which was a little over a week before this, the Smith article. And that grant application described the entire technology that we had in the patent application, showed that the inventor had invented it at least as of December, 2003, and because of that great record keeping, which was in notebooks and, and also in this grant application, we could show that in fact, our inventor had invented their technology before this January, 2004 uh, published article by, uh, by Smith. So it saved the day. We were able to uh, show the patent examiner that we had in fact invented this uh, technology before Smith ever came along uh, and good result for Penn, uh, secured a patent and uh, again, just all because of some really good record keeping uh, by, by the inventor. So just, I know everyone's in great habits to keep keeping great notebooks, um, but this is a good uh, example of why, um, you know, how, how and why that can, can really pay off. We have a question. If an inventor does get federal funding, what kind of effects does it have towards the patent application process? That, that's a good question. Um, I think in terms of patent application process, in terms of writing the patent application, it's important to include uh, federal funding in the uh, sort of in the body of the patent application, part of the obligations of the, the recipient of the funding. So um, from kind of a nuts and bolts perspective, that's, uh, that's sort of one piece of it. There's, there's another piece 
uh, and I, I don't want to put Jennifer on the spot, but I'll just sort of mention it, that there are certain uh, reporting requirements that the institution that receives the funding, that institution has certain um, kind of reporting, uh, or, or sometimes they're called compliance requirements, where they have to report back uh, to the funding agency about what, uh, you know, what the funding was used for. And, and I, I think as far as kind of patent applications that are filed that are based on, on a given grant or, or grant number. So I will, uh, I don't want to put Jennifer on the spot, but I, I, I just thought I'd mention that. And, and, no, uh, I'm happy, I'm happy to yeah. be put on the spot, Aaron, um, because the truth of the matter is outside counsel works with a lot of different types of inventors, not all of whom are receiving federal funding. So the university should be the lead on the federal funding front. So on our invention disclosure, um, we do include questions about how an invention was funded, if it was funded using federal funding, see what the agency and the grant number is. And that would be, the question is, is it, was the invention conceived and and or first actually reduced to practice. So Aaron, I, I, I know we'll get a little bit more into what that you know, to what that means, but if you don't know the answer to that question, you can work with PCI on it because can, candidly, it's not always necessarily like an aha moment with an invention and, and talking it through is a good idea. So the invention disclosure would have information about that. We are then required to report the invention to the agency. We are required to notify the agency that we want to take title of the invention, meaning that we want to file the patent and try to license it. We are required to report on the filing. We are required to report on our licensing activity. It's the short version of a long story, but it's a lot of back and forth reporting. And then also what we report needs to match what you report on your grant closeout statements to the government. So that all of that is handled um, in conjunction with us. Hopefully that answers the question. That's great. Thank, thanks, Jennifer. And uh, Jennifer brought up a, a really good um, point, which is we talked earlier about keeping good records of when, an, uh, when a particular idea or, or technology was conceived. And Jennifer mentioned um, this sort of term of art called uh, reduction to practice, which <clears throat> excuse me, refers to when, when the technology was first sort of embodied in, in sort of a prototype uh, or an experiment, you know, basically something that, uh, you know, kind of embodies and, and, you know, that technology where the technology was performed. So um, the date of conception when something was first sort of, uh, you know, generated mentally, that, that's an important date. And, and just as Jennifer said it, other important dates are when it was first uh, reduced to practice, even if it was reduced to practice in kind of a, you know, kind of a version 1.0 form in the lab, uh, you know, kind of a beta test version, something like that. Um, anything where it was sort of embodied and, and first performed uh, kind of in the real world, um, those are important dates as, as well. Um, because again, you know, looking at this, uh, this timeline here, um, showing that you, you the inventor, conceived your invention or reduced it to practice before the date of something that the patent examiner is using against you, um, that can be very powerful and very, very useful. We can see here in um, you know, this example where it, it really did save the day um, and, and protected this, uh, this particular patent application. Later on, if the patent is to be sold, does the federal funder have ownership or is the inventor obligated to pay the federal funder on the sale? So, so no, what we do, when we receive federal funding, we notify, the university is the owner of the IP, we notify the government, um, we ask to take title or ownership, which has been universally granted as long as we continue with our compliance obligations. And then the government does retain certain rights, but we still, we don't sell the patent, but we are able to license it to, to other companies. Um, and the, the government doesn't sort of recollect on the grants or the funds that they that they provided. The whole concept of this is basically the, the universities and the individual grant recipients are probably more effective at, at translating the research um, and identifying partners. Um, and that's that's sort of the principle is that's what's best for the for the public. So okay and one other quick follow-up. I read somewhere about changes in recent years that men first to file Trump's first to invent. If so, can you speak to that? That's a bigger issue everyone's been grappling with, I know. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. So yeah, someone's been doing some some good uh, advanced homework. So uh, that, uh, it's an excellent question. Um, yes, there there is there has been sort of a change in um, kind of the U.S. the U.S. patent laws that that does, as you say, sort of put more of a premium. Excuse me on <coughs> excuse me on, on first to file. Um, I think what's uh, in some ways, what, what it, the change is really more sort of first to disclose. So you can kind of put a, a stake in the ground as far as your earliest date of um, kind of your earliest, I guess we'd call it sort of critical date. Um, 
by by just dis disclosing your technology before someone else files a patent application. Um, but as we saw earlier, I, I won't roll back through all the slides. Um, you don't want to do that unless you filed your own patent application before you you disclose. Um, so I, I think you know there has been a change in the law that that does put more of a premium on on first to file. Um, but I think it, it, the sort of the best practice of filing your patent application as early as possible uh, and preferably before your own publication, that, that sort of best practice kind of remains. Um, so I think the, you know, again, the best practice of, of I mean, really engaging with PCI as, as early as possible in, in your, um, you know, your technology development and, and your own publication process, that, that still remains the, the same. So I would say um, always check in with PCI first, uh, you know, before and after that, that change in the law. So, okay. Um, so another true story, uh, this one, I, I have changed the names. Uh, it does not involve University of Pennsylvania, but it's, I think it's a good illustration. Um, 2006, uh, imagine uh, this, this has to do with, with uh, a professor who moved from, we'll just call it Alpha University to Beta. Uh, and uh, in 2007 at Beta University, they filed a patent application on a technology that uh, I just say turned lead into gold. Uh, so, uh, in 2009, this patent application uh, publishes online. So typically patent applications publish about 18 months or so after they're, they're filed. Uh, and Alpha University, uh, Professor X's former employer notices this and they say, wait a minute, that, that technology on, on lead to gold, that looks awfully familiar to us. Um, this seems like something that was maybe developed while you, Professor X, while you worked for Alpha University, not for beta. Um, so there's a little bit of uh, back and forth, uh, sort of shin kicking. And it turns out that in 2005, Professor X's advisor, um, or sort of a more senior professor at Alpha University had actually sent themselves an email describing this lead into gold process and also described sh then sharing that idea with Professor X. So in fact, uh, this very helpful and uh, convenient email that Professor X X's advisor had sent themselves back in 2005, showed that in fact, the advisor and not Professor X was the true inventor uh, of this technology. They were the one who sort of conceived this idea for the particular method of, of turning lead into gold. Uh, and because of that, Alpha University and not Beta uh, ultimately owned uh, the patent that related to, to turning lead into gold. Um, so I, I've kind of simplified some of the facts here, but again, a great example of why good record keeping, keeping track of the dates that, that Jennifer mentioned earlier, um, dates of conception, um, you know, keeping track of, of the cast of characters, who did what, when, um, really uh, resolved, uh, you know, what was kind of a sticky situation, as you can imagine, between Professor X, um, their former employer, Alpha University, and, and their later employer, Beta University. So uh, again, record keeping to the rescue um, and, and it really helped resolve what what was kind of a sticky you know sticky situation um, so uh, I'm going to move off now of uh, kind of record keeping it and we want to um, just kind of some general trends in in patent law I know we've seen a lot of things obviously a lot of innovations happening recently with with COVID-19 vaccines uh, but you know other other things meta, you know personal protective equipment uh, you know, and, and other things. So um, it'd be interesting to just kind of take a look through some surveys and some recent uh, research that actually the US Patent Office has done uh, on its own initiative um, to see, you know, just some trends that, that have come up recently. So um, here you can see uh, kind of recent patenting trends by technology area kind of uh, over the last, you know, a couple of years, really a decade from 2007 through 2018. Um, so I know that the bars are a little bit narrow here, um, but there's a couple of things I thought I would highlight just for kind of general, uh, you know, general interest. Um, one thing, unsurprising, uh, technology applications in artificial intelligence have really taken off, um, really starting since 2000, uh, you know, nine and 10. You can see they were a little bit flat, uh, tw you know, toward the end of the, the 2000s and then like really took off. No surprise there. Um, also, uh, Internet of Things, IoT, uh, really taking off since, um, you know, really since the, you know, 2000s, um, you know, we're certainly surrounded by, by Internet of Things, you know, smart thermostats, uh, smart watches, all that kind of stuff. That's really taken off. Um, medical uh, devices, also a real growth area. 
Um, you know, this can include things that, excuse me, have some technology uh, or you know digital technology in them. Um, you know, things like uh, you know smart uh, you know insulin pumps. Uh, you know, things like that. Um, also, orthopedic devices. You know, bone. Uh, you know, things to, to repair trauma, that sort of thing, um, a real growth area. Um, one area that I, I thought was interesting, and you can see there's been some growth in, you know, wireless phones and, and blockchain is small. Um, the thing that I thought was interesting was um, clean tech, um, you know, sort of wind, alternative energy, uh, you know, things like that, uh, water purification, you know, things like that. Um, that was, uh, again, I don't want to date myself, but back in the 2000s, that was a big growth area. And you can see that that sort of peaked and is kind of declining. Um, so it may be that, you know, some of the real innovation is, is happening in some of the areas we saw earlier. Um, again, you know, artificial intelligence, um, IoT, um, things like that. Um, and clean tech seems to be a little bit on, on the decline um, right now. You know, that can always change, but I thought that was interesting because if, uh, you know, back in 2007 and 2008, clean tech was, was going really, um, you know, kind of like gangbuster. So, you know, interesting, some interesting trends here. I think part of that trend had to do with the Obama administration putting out a lot of incentives and subsidies for um, clean tech innovation but that's an aside. Um, so maybe that could change given um, what's happening with um, our national government. I don't know. If someone discloses the thought in a Zoom meeting like this or a smaller meeting, will it be counted as a qualified disclosure? Yeah, that's a good question. So would, would that disclosure sort of start the clock ticking? I hate to say it depends, but I'll say it depends. Um, I would say chances are probably not um, in the sense that it, it is, public in the sense that, well, it's not, it's not 100% public in the sense that it's not open to just anyone who could just sort of, you know, jump in. I think, you know, uh, you know, Laurie's got control of the, you know, who can enter this, this Zoom meeting um, and, and see things. Um, it's not a huge audience, um, number one. And these are sort of factors that I suppose a court might look at, which is sort of the, the audience. Um, I don't know that because the Zoom meeting, I know it's being recorded. I don't know that the recording itself would be publicly accessible. And I think that would be that would be an important fact if, if a court were looking at whether a, you know, kind of a discussion during a Zoom meeting um, of an idea, if, if that would count, as you say, of, if that would sort of start the clock ticking or, or count as a, a qualifying um, disclosure. So I think probably the answer is probably not. Um, I would say the safe thing is to tell everyone that you have a great idea, then write it down and then tell PCI. Uh, and then after that, you can uh, you can share it. So I, I think a discussion during a Zoom meeting, probably um, if the Zoom meeting has sort of a closed, like private audience, probably wouldn't count in the same sense that, um, you know, like a like an oral defense of a thesis, um, that's not really considered public. There is an audience, but the audience, you know, who can be in the audience is, is kind of controlled. So I, I think it probably wouldn't. Um, kind of start the clock ticking. Uh, in keeping with these sort of patenting trends, I mentioned that the uh, the U.S. Patent Office, um, who has a very dynamic director now, um, has been doing some kind of uh, you know kind of inward facing research, and they've they've put out a, a very recent study um, just from October, um, you know, just a month ago, um, sort of tracing uh, you know kind of the what they call the diffusion of AI. Um, sort of, and they've done this through through U.S. patents, so they've kind of taken an internal inventory in, in the sense of you know just how patents related to AI have, uh, you know, how they've evolved um, in, in the last couple of years. Um, and actually, ironically, um, to do this, what they did was they wrote an AI algorithm to search their own database. Um, so AI uh, is basically researching itself. Uh, so the couple, uh, the way that they broke this down was AI sort of has a couple different flavors that it, it's used. I mean, I, I won't go through all these, but um, AI pops up in speech or speech recognition or things like uh, Alexa, um, you know, those sorts of, uh, you know, AI type assistance that people might have in their homes or, or perhaps cars. Um, you may have AI assisted vision, um, you know, or imaging type things, uh, machine learning and, and so on. So AI takes a lot of different forms. And what's interesting is the PTO came up with a couple of key findings um, that I, I thought I would just sort of blow up a couple of these. Um, so one of them was that in, in the 16 years from, from 2002 to 2018, um, you know, the, the number of applications related to AI uh, just kind of exploded, um, you know, doubled uh, really in, in that sort of decade and a half um, to over 60,000 every year, uh, which is like 5,000 AI applications a month. Um, it's pretty, pretty sizable. 
Um, and then interestingly, the, the share of all patent applications that the US Patent Office reviews grew from 9%, which is like one in 10, to nearly 16%, they say, which is like one in six. So, you know, one in every six patent applications um, has some form of AI in it, whether it's, you know, speech recognition, um, could be some sort of, uh, you know, computer vision, maybe an algorithm to help uh, process medical imaging, all, all those sorts of things. Um, it's really, really taking off. Um, and what, what's also interesting is the uh, sort of the percentage of, of inventors who, who are active in AI. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at, at uh, you know, sort of unique and, and repeat inventors um, in, in 1976, I'm not even sure what they call it, artificial intelligence back then. Uh, that was like 1% of, of inventors had something to do with AI. And now it's 25%. So of every inventor listed on a patent application in 2018, um, one in four of them is, is dealing with some sort of AI technology, which is a pretty, pretty, impredi- pretty incredible acceleration. Um, and they just sort of point out that, you know, AI, it's, it's kind of everywhere. Um, you know, that they say, you know, you've got inventors and, and patentees in Oregon, they say are, are using AI in, in fitness training. Um, whereas in North Dakota, uh, you know, AI is used in agriculture um, to sort of speed and, and, and sort of make, uh, you know, harvesting more, more efficient. So a lot of different places that AI pops up um, and it's just, it's accelerating at, at quite a rate. And I think the, you know, the US Patent Office is responding there, you know, I think by doing this kind of research, they have a sense of what they need to do. So they're hiring more examiners with uh, backgrounds in AI. Uh, so I think they're trying to meet kind of their uh, kind of the needs of their their stakeholders. Um, so another uh, sort of recent research that they've done, um, and this is also pretty hot off the press, only a couple months old, um, was sort of an update that the patent office did on on women uh, inventor patentees. And uh, this this study was. Interesting, I, I thought I'd pull out just sort of one of the, the key, key charts, um, which is showing, you know, since 1976, um, the sort of two lines here are interesting. One is the, the dotted line that shows percent of patents with, it, with at least one, one woman inventor patentee. Um, and you can see that that's grown to today to be, um, you know, over 20%. So over 20% of patents issued in, in, in 2020 um, include at least one woman uh, inventor or, or patentee, which is, um, you know, at least an improvement over where things stood in, in 1976. Um, and then sort of the, the solid purple line um, shows percent of women among all inventors. And, and that's been, been growing. Uh, it's, it's over, you know, it's north of 10% now getting toward, toward 15. Uh, and, you know, there's been some, you know, some growth in, and I think some improvement um, since, uh, since 1976. And uh, I should say that these, these reports are available off of the US Patent Office website. So you can certainly take a look at those. Um, and what's interesting in, in the, um, this report that we're looking at here is they also um, do sort of a breakdown of, of uh, kind of most frequent patent applicants. In other words, companies such as IBM, Cisco, that sort of thing, and sort of the percentage of um, women inventors on patent applications from those companies. So it's interesting to see how different companies have, uh, you know, kind of evolved, uh, well, really going back to 1976. So I definitely encourage everyone to take a look at these, um, you know, these, these reports. They're, they're, they're very um, uh, easy to find on, on the Patent Office website. Um, so there's a couple trends um, and I, I just don't wanna take up everybody's time uh, or I'm gonna leave some time for questions that is. So uh, in summary, uh, again, inventors, engineers, uh, they make the commercialization process happen uh, at, at sort of all stages. Um, again, second bullet point, can't say enough, but I will uh, advise PCI before you publicly disclose your technology uh, because that can, can really have an effect on patent rights, which in turn can affect <clears throat> the ability to, to commercialize. Um, the, the technology. Um, and again, you know, we talked earlier about the four flavors of IP. Patents is, is only one of those. Um, and so to the extent that inventors, engineers, and, and everyone else, um, you may have other developments that have commercial potential, um, you know, software, other tangible materials um, that might not be patentable, um, but they may still have commercial potential. And, and those are the kinds of things that, that PCI um, you know, is, is always interested to hear about. Uh, those things can be valuable. And, and I, you know, certainly encourage everyone to um, advise PCI of, of other tech, you know, developments, even if they're not necessarily patentable. Uh, and again, just to kind of bang on the, the record keeping drum one last time, um, keeping good records of team personnel, 
um, their contributions, grant support, as we talked about earlier, and key dates. Um, it just, it, it, it's so important. It can save a patent application um, and it can just save a lot of, uh, you know, just sort of heartburn and, and just sort of administrative uh, work down the road. So, uh, you know, keep, keep those good records and, and keep those good notebooks. Um, so that's, that's about all I have. So I'll sort of stop there and, and happy to, to take other, other questions. Um, when filing a medical patent, does the product being patented need to be approved by the FDA before, for example, if the product is not directly usable and not made yet, but it is a unique idea device, can it still be patented? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, the, the answer is yes, it can be patented without, um, FDA approval. Those those agencies, the the patent office and the FDA, um, uh, they they sort of operate independently. Um, so it is not necessary when it comes to a you know something that would would ordinarily require <laughs> excuse me FDA approval. Um, it's not necessary to obtain approval uh, before filing a patent application. You know that I mean it can take some time. Uh, you know certainly to obtain you know those sorts of approvals. So. Uh, yes, not necessary. Um, filing a patent application shouldn't hold up, you know, any applications for, for other regulatory approval. You can kind of do them in, in parallel at the same time. But um, yeah, FDA approval not needed for uh, for patenting on, on medical uh, devices or, or technologies. Can you talk a bit about the time required um, by anyone who's pursuing a patent in terms of the process? Uh, in terms of the timeline, um, you know, certainly step one, uh, after you've conceived the idea um, and, and kind of, uh, you know, maybe reduce it to practice, uh, of course, consult with PCI. Um, in terms of the timeline, once a patent application has been filed, um, the timeline is a little bit variable because, uh, you know, you, you can kind of get things started at a patent office quickly. You can also slow things down a bit if you, if you want. Um, but I would say, you know, at the US Patent Office, just me as an example, um, typically once an application is filed at the U.S. Patent Office, uh, the Patent Office needs a little bit of time to, to make sure the, the application is sent to the right examiner with the right um, you know, te technical background to evaluate it. Um, examiners have their own backlog, but I think right now the sort of the lag time at the U.S. Patent Office is, is about 14 months. Um, so a little bit over a year from the time the application is filed till the time that you'll hear, kind of get your first um, piece of feedback from, from the US patent examiner. And, and I should say there are ways to speed that up. Um, you know, there's certain, you know, programs that the US patent office has where you can kind of, uh, I, I won't say cut a cut in line, but I say, you know, I would say, you know, ways to sort of skip ahead. Um, but if you don't do one of those programs and you just kind of let the patent application take its, um, you know, its natural course, it's about 14 months um, or so, at least right now. And, you know, after that, you could figure maybe you have a, you know, one or two sort of back and forth rounds with the patent examiner where you explain to them what the technology is, explain to them how it's different than, um, than what's come before. And there can be, you know, a couple, you know, each of those rounds could be a couple months. So, you know, it, it could be, you know, depending on how things go with the examiner, it could be, you know, six to 12 months after you get your first, um, Evaluation, so you know it could be two, could be could be a year and a half or two years from the time you file a patent application. But again, there are ways to speed that up. If someone has an idea that they think is patentable, who at PCI should I talk to? And I'll just say the answer to that is your licensing officer. So Pam Beatrice is the head of licensing for Penn Engineering as well as um, other parts of Penn. I'll definitely put her in contact info in the group chat. Um, but in general, the licensing officer is the first person you should have a conversation with and she'll, um, that person will then um, collaborate and coordinate with Jen Langenberger, IP director um, and her group. Um, so if you don't know who those people are, feel free to contact um, me at, or anyone at PCI. Um, back to the, um, just pa another patenting question. How and where does one search if anyone else has filed a patent on same or similar idea? This is a good question. Is there any standard database list anywhere or just randomly go searching on the internet? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, 
So, right, is, is there a database and should you just randomly search? Um, I guess on some level, the answer to both of those is, it, it, in some ways, is kind of yes. Um, so there's one place to search is, is Google Patents. So if you, if you Google the words Google Patents, um, it will take you to a um, kind of a section of Google that, that's you know, basically a, a database of US and, and other internet, well, US and international patents. So you can kind of search that, keyword searches. Um, that kind of describe the the technology that you're you're interested in, and um, that's one place to look. Um, the U.S. Patent Office has its own uh, database that lets you search um, the U.S. Patent Office's own own records, and that's also kind of a keyword searchable database. Um, and by keyword, I mean you can use words that describe your technology. You can also search uh, on on company names. You know, if you want to see. Uh, you know, I don't know what kind of vaccines Moderna has developed in the last 10 years. Um, you can certainly search on Moderna's name, um, things like that. Uh, and I think, you know, it's a good question because, uh, and then you can also just sort of type in, um, you know, just into the regular, regular Google search bar um, or Google Scholars, another good, good place to look for articles. Um, you know, use those keywords that describe the technology you're interested in to see what other people have been up to because you may, um, discover in, you know, 15 or 20 minutes of searching that um, what you're interested in has has already been done. Um, and, you know, that's sometimes that can be disappointing, but but it's always good to know, um, you know, one way or the other. So, uh, yeah, so long answer to short question, but yes, there are data databases, Google patents, um, the USPTO's own database, and, you know, even just kind of a regular search through Google and, and Google Scholar can be um, productive. What is your opinion on provisional patents? If I have a provisional patent and I want to turn it into a patent, do I need to start back as a new application? Yeah, that's a, a good question. So if you have a provisional patent application on file, um, the answer is no, in the sense you, you don't have to start over. If you, if you have a provisional patent, um, and as you say in, in, in the question, if, if you want to turn that into a patent, um, you don't have to make any changes to your provisional patent application. You can just uh, sort of do what's called converting it and take that provisional patent application and file it um, word for word, exactly the same, file it as a regular patent application that, that will be examined by, um, by the patent office. Um, on the other hand, uh, you may have developed some new data, say experimental results or made some other advancements or, or refinements to your technology between the time that you filed your provisional patent application and the time that your, your regular patent application is due. In other words, one, one year from the date of the, the provisional. So um, if you've made advancements, uh, you know, improvements, uh, you, you know, anything, anything you want to include, anything you have in hand that you want to include in your, your sort of formal patent application, uh, you can add it to the provisional uh, when, you, when, you, when you convert that provisional application. Um, so you don't need to start over. Um, you can really just add on to uh, what's already in, in your provisional. Aaron, thank you so much. This was really informative. There's a lot of PCI staff who are involved in this process and ready to talk to you about the best way to get started. So um, Pam and her team, um, most of whom I think are actually um, here today, are the best people to contact initially. Um, but Jen and her team are very involved um, once the process gets started. So um, there's a lot of folks at PCI to support this effort on behalf of Penn and external partners. And um, in any case, and it's great to have Aaron and um, his partnership as we pursue all this patenting. Um, and thank you for highlighting how Many, we actually received 84 patents this last fiscal year, um, which means the last two or three years, we were very, very busy doing a lot of um, kind of idea assessment and filing with people like Aaron. So we appreciate all of your partnership as well. 